Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Dialogue, the Dire Point podcast. Today, I have Toka Gad, our digital marketing manager who you met earlier on the podcast. And today, we're going to have a talk about health and how that is affected by social media. Uh, Toka and I talk about this a lot because as our digital marketing manager, she's reviewing all our posts. She's seeing what's being shared in social media about health, wellness, and diabetes. And we have a lot of these like shocking moments where we can't believe what we're seeing sometimes. And also she's become quite an expert on the subject because she's done her thesis and studied the topic of eating disorders and social media. So she's got a lot of special insight to this. So because so many people are taking health advice from the internet I thought it would be really good for us to have a chat about this. And this may not, there's so much to talk about. Let's see how far we can dive into the subject. We may have to keep diving in, but it's a start because there's a lot to to highlight, I think. So Toka, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And thank you for the nice introduction. So like you said, we're usually facing shocking misconceptions on social media. And I think my first question to you would be, what makes some people more prone to believing or falling for some misconceptions when it comes to health specifically? Mm. So there's a study I heard someone talk about. And when people, if, if someone is certain about something and the tone of the voice or the writing, or if it's a video and they are very confident in how they say it, that can be convincing enough for so many people. Mm -hmm. That's true. So it's a marketing thing or the language. The language, the marketing, or sometimes there's even people out there that, you know, might be doctors that have a certain belief that maybe could be an older belief that could be disproved or that for whatever reason, they believe something could be their title, could be who they're associated with. Mm -hmm. Could be who follows them, could be maybe a famous, well-known famous influencer or somebody even liked that or reshared it. So there's so many different things that I think affect what people think. And for people who have issues with access to proper health care, does that make them more prone to this or do you think it's the same for everyone? Oh, no, I think for sure it probably makes people more prone to it because you're desperate for information and you need to get to get access and you're not sure who to look to or where to turn to. Mm -hmm. And this is one reason why I started this podcast, actually, because I love to write, but not everyone likes to read or has the time to read. And I thought having a podcast where we talk to people about living with diabetes or experts in the field, in area, medical field, giving quality information about diabetes, I thought this would be a really good way to reach people. Mm-hmm. And I, that's also why we're starting the Diabetes Hour in Arabic, because yes. it's highly underserved and there's not enough there's tons of information in English, good and bad, but Mm. there's more, you know, there's a lot of good information, good quality information in English. I don't want to say it's all bad out there. Mm. It's not because we do follow people that are doing amazing jobs and sharing quality information, but there's not enough of that in Arabic. And that's a population that's highly underserved. Mm. Um, So that's why we started diabetes hour because not everyone has access to a whole comprehensive diabetes team or quality information on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. It might be a nice time to uh, recap our podcast audience since it's a new initiative that Diabetes Hour is our free live sessions in Arabic with doctors and healthcare providers from ASPID. And as you said, this is important because in the region, there are some issues with access to quality information. And this makes people more prone to falling for misconceptions on social media. So it's great to have valuable information with trusted doctors on the same social media platforms to combat this issue. So yeah, Diabetes Hour definitely aligns with this. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry, before you go on, and it will be the, the fourth Tuesday of every month. 
yes. at 7 p.m. GMT plus four. And I reached out to ASPED, probably it was in October, just before the ISPED meeting. ASPED is the Arab Society of Pediatric Endo and Ad Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes. Um, so I reached out to them just before the ISPED meeting in um in Abu Dhabi and I because I was listening to someone that was living in a country where you know people weren't able to access information or doctors easily and mm -hmm. I hear this a lot mm -hmm. like like a lot from from very strong advocates in the region mm -hmm. and I thought you know what can we do about this so thank you Asped for um and Dr. Asma and Dr. Hussein um, for, you know, agreeing to do this and collaborate with us for this and helping people, you know, get, get this information. So on the fourth Tuesday of every month, uh, GMT plus four, that's 7 p.m. Dubai time, there will be a qualified ASPED physician online to talk about a topic and then answer any questions that you have about it in mm -hmm. Arabic. Yes. Exactly. And Toka will facilitate those because her Arabic's way yes. better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I will. So then before going back to my questions about misconceptions, I think here we entered an area where social media can also be beneficial. So it's like a double edged sword, like they say, because there are all these misconceptions, but there's also all this opportunity for collaborations like Diabetes Hour, where we can combat this issue by providing quality and trusted information. So my question here would be, what would you suggest that corporations would do more of to help this? What would you hope that even we can do more of one day to continue to combat this and take initiatives like Diabetes Hour further? Or are there other creative solutions that come to mind where partnerships or individual companies can do something on social media to fight all the misconceptions and also give people a chance to find quality information easier? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think, you know, one of the words that you mentioned, partnerships, I think that's really important mm -hmm. to partner with organizations, people, um, individuals that are, are doing quality things. And some organizations do have their own quality um, videos and social media and things where they share information. I think sometimes people are hesitant to follow and trust a large corporation, particularly in the medical field, mm -hmm. because of all the discussion around, you know, they just want the money or whatever it is, but they do have qualified physicians working for them or working with them, qualified people. Um, we've actually partnered with an organization, with a company, and the result of that will be out soon, mm -hmm. where we're trying to reach more people to bring quali you know, quality information to the masses. Mm -hmm. I think also sometimes, you know, it's very hard to, you have to focus on I guess what you can do. So it's hard for larger companies to be part of calling out the negative information. And sometimes they probably don't want to take the risk. Mm -hmm. um, they're afraid of that. But I think that there's a proper way to do it without having, you know, it become like a legal issue. There's, there's a polite and professional way to offset it, something that's negative or or call it out. I, I would love to see more of that. I see a lot of advocates calling things out, but from the, the company perspective, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think that they think it's, you know, maybe they don't think it's as big of an issue or they, they have to focus on, on other things because if you took the time to start calling out everything mm -hmm. in the beginning, when I started Diapoint, and it was a very small company. Even before actually I started Diapoint as a company, I spent a lot of time calling things out that were wrong mm -hmm. or the stupid things. I'm, and I'm just going to say the word stupid things people would say. Mm -hmm. um, even once there was something, a comedian in the US, Jimmy Kimmel, he put something stupid on Twitter. Someone sent him a box of donuts and he hashtagged it something about diabetes. And I wrote him a very long letter. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, 
I think I have it somewhere on the blog too. I'm not even sure, but, but that kind of I stuff, that like, it, yeah, I mean, that drives me absolutely crazy. People that are in, you know, a position to support people and a few, a few months after he was on TV and very upset because his his child has a chronic um, heart condition or something was having surgery, which I can imagine is quite scary for a parent. And then to just go kind of without realizing he thought he was being funny, but without realizing that you're harming people <clears throat> with another chronic condition just blew my mind. So I would spend a lot of time on stuff like that because it really annoys me. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be corrected and people are misinformed or people are getting shamed and blamed for diabetes. But then I got to a point where I don't call it out as much anymore, or I don't spend as much time on it because I need to serve more people. I can't correct Jimmy Kimmel's behavior or his opinions, and I can advocate for people and stand up for them. And but now I, education. yeah. And now I think, what is the best use of that time? Mm -hmm. So I think that's one reason why companies, you know, don't always, don't always do it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people living with diabetes or any other chronic condition are at more risk of serious harm from the misinformation on social media? For sure. A thousand percent. So that's why I always say, if you hear us talk about something, please go back, ask your doctor, ask your diabetes team. Even if we interview a doctor here or we're quoting something from a study, mm -hmm. don't just go out and change your medication or how much insulin you take. It can be harmful. Mm -hmm. um, you could die if you get the wrong medical advice. You really could. Mm -hmm. And we always, you know, everything comes with a disclaimer. Um that it's it's not medical advice and you need to seek proper medical advice and and you need to get it but if you have a chronic condition of any kind and especially with all the health and wellness and natural things that there are on the internet and i love that stuff like i i'm looking for my next uh health and wellness certification and other natural things that are scientifically proven to be beneficial but none of them are going to cure diabetes especially like type 1 yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that can help you if you have type two, like eating plant-based and doing all of these other things, mm -hmm. that's not going to harm you if you change your eating habits. But if someone's telling you, you only need to eat plants and then you can just immediately stop your medication, that's like not sound advice. That's just like one example. Um, <clears throat> or even if you're dealing with cancer or something like this, there's so many, Things I've seen where people have said, you know, they have the cure um, for cancer and you need you need to speak to a qualified doctor yeah. that, that knows what they're talking about. I think it's also that people living with chronic conditions might be more curious to look for health related advice on social media. And then it's also a topic where there is higher chance where the advice is crazy risky and has nothing to do with your tests and your medical file. Like for example, I found out that taking my insulin this way did me wonders. So I'm just sharing it for an entire audience to do the same when they all have completely different diabetes management plans and A1Cs and everything. And yeah, that exactly. makes exactly Yeah, no, that's so true. And I, even mm -hmm. as you were talking about that, I think about when Aaron was first diagnosed and I was so desperately looking for an answer or looking for what I could do to fix it. Mm -hmm. And over time I realized I couldn't fix it. And I even went to the naturopath that I had been seeing mm -hmm. when I, I took my son to her and I said, this is the case. And she got up out of her chair and she hugged me. Oh. That's all she could do because <laughs> she knew there was no cure. Yeah. So that's the kind of like naturopath you need in your life. Not one that's going to say, oh, try this, 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 and then we'll fix it several months later. Mm -hmm. And I've even had people ask me like why I'm afraid of Eastern medicine and stuff like that for my son. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, there, there's a time and a place to mention death. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't take it lightly, but for people that are super insistent that I try something natural and then it will just, I'll be able to take my sun off medication or someone once told me that um transcendental meditation would cure it 
Interesting. Then I, I, I have to kind of go there and say, no, it won't. He'll die without insulin straight up. Um, so, so yeah, you have to be so careful. And as, like I said, when you first get some kind of health diagnosis, that's chronic, Mm -hmm. it's very normal and very common to, to look for a cure. Or I see a lot of people talking about the benefits of vinegar and Mm -hmm. some of them, uh, and, and people that give great quality information, they'll show like kind of the curve of blood sugar and what happens if you have a teaspoon of, ins- uh, not insulin, sorry, a teaspoon of vinegar before you eat. And that can be great for maybe most people. But mm-hmm. let's say if you have someone that's dealing with like severe ulcerative colitis, that mm-hmm. could potentially just like burn their intestine on the way down. And maybe, maybe that's going to do something to another chronic condition that they have. I'm just thinking out loud because sometimes I think vinegar on an empty stomach can be harsh. Mm -hmm. I gave, I mixed it in my dog's food once because I read like, look, talk about taking bad health advice. So (laughs) totally not related, but, or kind of related. So there's a dog group here and there's a lot of people out there that are very much into like natural things for their dog. So, so for the, the dog's and cats as well. <clears throat> There's a medicine you can take so they don't get fleas, they don't get ticks. And mm-hmm. basically it's like a little bit of a poison so that those animals would die and not stay on your dog. And so that gets in their blood system, right? Mm-hmm. And I was once reading and this woman, this and this is a perfect example. Like I myself am like falling for maybe not the best medical advice and not asking the veterinarian about this. She's like, don't give your dog this medicine. It's like horrible, it's bad, which of course it probably isn't the best thing, but it offsets another problem. Mm-hmm. Every medication has complications. And then she's like, I just mix a, like a teaspoon of uh, vinegar in my dog's food. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's interesting. It's time for him to like start taking the medication again. Cause you have to give it every six months or whatever. I'll try that. So I mixed vinegar in his food one morning And the look he was giving me, he's eating it. He looks up at me and you can see like, it's probably really bitter and sour. (laughs) I know it was just a tiny, but I didn't even do the whole recommended dose. (laughs) And um, he finished it, but let's just say he also on his next walk went to the bathroom a lot, (laughs) like a lot. So it (laughs) it was not, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, not, not all natural advice is helpful for everyone, including your dog. Yeah. So you mentioned something about disclaimers that usually in our content, not only do we mention that, for example, something other than vinegar, let's say increasing plants in your diet, that can be good for you as an example. But we also say that go back to your doctor if you're going to make a drastic change to your diet make sure that this is okay with your blood tests and everything and so on these kinds of disclaimers i think they are one of the signs of quality information for me on social media when it comes to medical things my question would be what are the other signs that you take that this information is authentic or good or trusted and that you would advise people to search for and how would you advise them to differentiate between misinformation and high quality information? Because at the end, like you said, many people need the free source of information and social media is free. So it's not going to stop that, especially people with chronic conditions will be desperately looking for help on social media. So how can we help them differentiate between good resources and bad ones? Mm, that's a really good question. So, I mean, first you can look at what, what is the source there's particularly when it comes to diabetes, we know who the authorities are on this. If you see like a Mayo clinic or Jocelyn diabetes center, or one of the well-known centers of the world talking Mm -hmm. about something, or even like diatribe that they, they do such great, great work, you know, it's quality information. So you can consider the source. If you've never heard of the source before, so dig deeper, look at the links. If there's a website, look who's certified them. Are they certified? Sometimes also I've seen like there was one kind of natural, um, you know, maybe vegetarian or, or some kind of account I was following because they had posted one thing that I really liked that I thought was great. 
the next week they posted something that was so far out there in left field that like I stopped following them. So you can look not just at one of their posts, but look at other posts and see what they're saying. If it feels off, then question it. And if it's something that's quote unquote new that you've not heard of before mm -hmm. and none of the other authority figures are talking about it, that might be something to question. Mm -hmm. Google whatever they say, you know, this cure or this treatment is and search it further and see what comes up. Like, mm -hmm. for example, last week, there was a white paper that just came out showing that there's a new drug um, that was approved that you can take to postpone the onset of type one diabetes. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about this drug. I didn't share it. I didn't talk about it. Um, I've read about, you know, this research before and how that can possibly help, you know, scientists find a cure in the future. I'm not exactly sure how, because at this point in time, it kind of offsets the inevitable, but then maybe that gives them more time to work with people that they know that are going to be type one, and then they can do maybe some other trials or different things. But everybody in the medical community was talking about that. If you, if you would have seen that maybe just on one account and you didn't find it anywhere else, then it might be something to question, but it was in the news. It was, it was shared by, you know, quality, um, quality institutions or quality organizations that are supporting diabetes research and things like that. Mm -hmm. So like they always say, consider the source. If you know other people that have diabetes, ask them about it, maybe have a discussion about it and never be afraid to, you know, question all aspects of something. Mm -hmm. It's okay to question it even, you know, and it's not that you're not taking your doctor's advice, but if your doctor says, Hey, I think we need to increase this medication or decrease this one. You can ask why you can always ask that, you know, somebody why, or what do you think about that? Or, or why do I need to do that? Or if I do this, what's going to happen to, you know, the other things. So look for the relationships between who's accrediting them to give this information. Mm -hmm. Like we, we talk about information here all the time and we pull from different sources. I'm a certified coach. That doesn't mean I'm coaching everyone in the world, but any coach that works with Diapoint, we know that they're certified. It's mm -hmm. verified. We check it. We, you just, you have to, you have to dig deeper. And I understand people don't have the time to do that. It's not that you don't want to. So that's why it's always best to make sure that you're getting it from a source that you know is qualified. And I don't and, know, did I miss anything? No, no, you didn't. <laughs> it was a really good answer. Thank you. I know you don't like to use the word influencers, but I have to ask, what do you think of social media influencers or health influencers as um, information source. And then I want to go more diabetes specific <clears throat> because there are some people who live with diabetes and they share this journey online. And maybe you will answer my answer, my question about influencers, um, that it has some risks, which I might agree with. But I find it more confusing when it comes to diabetes influencers, if that's what we can call it. Because sharing this journey does benefit a lot of people, but it seems like there could also be a risk. So I want to know what your opinion on that is. Yeah, that's such a good point. And the word influencer is tricky. Somebody mm -hmm. was talking about this in a podcast I was listening to the other day. And instead of influencer, they used another word, which I found much more suitable. And I forget what the word was. Because when we think of influencer, we think of like a Kardashian, like influencer i guess <laughs> to some extent. in the diabetes world <laughs> that's not we're not like kardashian no no <laughs> someone a company once came to me and referred to me they said well you as an influencer for lack of a better word and i said i'm not an influencer <laughs> please find me <laughs> i'm a i'm a healthcare professional i i'm a company owner i'm a businesswoman but I'm not, I'm not here to, yeah, it's, it's a very loaded word and in healthcare, particularly mm -hmm. um, when it comes to diabetes, there's some very good influencers out there. Like in our, re our region, um, Yasmin Al-Shalabi that was on the panel for um, 
<clears throat> the human trial with us last week. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't have any more coffee or water left by me. Um, she is a great influencer. She shares her challenges with diabetes. She's very honest and frank about it. She talks about it in English and Arabic, which is wonderful. But what a lot of people probably don't realize is she's got a background as a nutritionist. She's a diabetes educator. She's yeah, educated she's and she she's living with diabetes. So not only is she living with it, but she's also educated about it. Mm -hmm. And there's other people like Mohammed Al-Bahar that lives in Kuwait and he's an Adidas front runner. He's been on the, the podcast before. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call him an influencer either. I, I guess I would call them more advocates. <clears throat> but they're they're very well educated um and and they you know they they know so people might consider this in the definition context as an influencer and i think people like that are are worth worth following and you can see even though mohammed al bahar is not a certified diabetes educator he knows so much shares so much information brings quality people together to talk about diabetes so I think you need to look at the what they're talking about. If you can dig deeper into their certifications, I think that's super helpful. I think it also has to do not just with their certifications, but like you said, what they talk about, because the examples, the great examples you mentioned of Muhammad and Yasmin, we never see them putting things like, for example, so when I eat a pizza, I do this. And this is what I find risky. Some people do this and then other people who live with diabetes think, okay, so then when I eat a pizza, I'm going to do the exact same thing. And they don't do that. They share information that is general, medically accredited and relates to everyone in a way that they can also take this information and verify it with a doctor according to their personal case before following it. And they also focus on advocacy. So I think in conclusion, when it comes to for lack of a better word, influencers, it's about their certification and what they talk about and how they talk about it. So yeah, um, now moving on to my favorite topic, because like you said, this is my thesis and I've been reading up a lot about this, eating disorders. So far, we've been talking about the negative effect of social media in providing wrong medical information. But there's a whole other dark side where it's not even providing information. It's just showing crazy ideals for health and body image. And just a few examples that I've been coming across during my study, there have been insane challenges for teens and young women the past few years online. For example, standing in front of a mirror and recording your thigh gap or holding a piece of paper in front of your stomach, an A4 paper, and showing that your stomach doesn't cross the board, the outer borders of this paper. I've never I've heard of that. Seen, oh my oh, God. I have been saying, seeing crazy things during my research, crazy. And this is not even called misinformation because there's no information being provided. I don't know what to call this, but I can tell you for sure that the number of eating disorders at least in young women, according to my study, is increasing insanely the past few years. And it is very closely tied to social media. And it doesn't even completely have to do with information, medical information, because most young women aren't really searching for health information online. It's just things that are out there in their face, telling them that the perfect image of health or being happy even is to look like this. Mm. So I want us to talk about this a little bit. And yeah. I think the first question would be, as a parent, what would you do to prepare your child to not fall for these um, insane trends or psychological effects of social media? First, I want to say that's horrible and shocking. And I think I don't have a girl, a daughter, I have a son, but they still have challenges with that. But I think back to what it was like for me as a teen, as a 13, as a 14 year old that didn't have a great body image. Um, and that's horrible. 
I can't imagine how much worse I would have felt if I had had challenges like that in social media and different things. Mm -hmm. It is really shocking. I, I've, not, I've not heard the thing about the A4 paper. That's horrible. Have you even, heard about Even at my age now, I'm like, if I go do that, like what's going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start like the antithesis of that challenge among like <laughs> 50 plus and women that are 50 plus. I don't know. That's crazy. Yeah. It is. It really is. And there was this other thing where they had to show their thigh gap and the bigger the thigh gap, apparently the bigger the video was a success and girls found it so impressive. And because of this, not only does it affect body image and mood and everything, according to many surveys, it makes so many young people. Eventually, I had to focus my research on young women specifically, but at the beginning, I saw it across guys as well. It's just stronger in females, I think, because the more negative videos and content is targeted to females for some reason. And I have seen that many people, many women would answer in surveys that up to their mid 20s, they were likely to starve themselves or take weird marketed pills online that promised to make them lose weight or do whatever crazy exercise would promise that their stomach would fit behind an Air Force paper and all these things. And I just keep wondering the question I still can't answer, maybe because I'm not a parent yet, maybe because you can't find this answer in research very directly. But I'm trying to find out in this day and time, if I have a little girl, how can I protect her from this? How can I prepare her so that this doesn't make her develop eating disorders? Because that's what's happening. Hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and and that must have been, I mean, also for you as a just a, a woman to see all that, that must yeah. be outrageous and making yes, just, so many, I can't imagine the emotions so the preparation for it. So I would say, and I know it's hard and the social pressure is harder even now than when Aaron was young mm -hmm. is, and I saw girls in primary school, like third grade having telephones. Mm -hmm. um, this was before TikTok was out, but they were in Facebook and, you know, already very into their phone. I was sitting behind two girls in his class once at a, a performance at a at the school he was at at the time. And I was just watching and listening. And, and it was shocking that at that age, you know, there was already that. So I would say try to hold off on getting them a phone. There's a, a movement in the U.S. called Wait Until Eight. I didn't watch that, um, but they had a, a viewing of it in my son's school and it means like wait until the eighth grade which I guess is when they're about 13 or 14 to get your child a mobile phone now again it's very convenient to sometimes you know find them to pick them up and different things like that so if you do get them a mobile device you need to have some real set restrictions around it Aaron had a mobile device slightly before Mm -hmm. Um, but that was simply so we could communicate about his diabetes. He's not got a CGM where I can track him and I get the number, but at school, he wasn't always getting like necessarily the support he needed before he moved to the school he's at now. So we could communicate, um, about, and he would step out of class and rather than take the five, 10 minute walk to the health office with a potentially low blood sugar down three flights of stairs. He kept a phone in his locker. Uh, we got permission for him to just call me, tell me that what it was so he could bowl us and then get back in class and not miss any more class. So for that, we did it with diabetes. It's tricky. And I do see, you know, these movements of like not having phones, not allowing phones in schools and this, that, the other. And, and I do think that's needed. But when you have a child with a chronic condition where sometimes their device depends on it, it's very tricky. Having said that, you can get a phone and just have that app on it and don't put any of the other junk on it. Mm -hmm. Before your child even has a phone, also, the other thing I was doing, again, before social media became what it is today, I love photography, but I wouldn't share so many of 
Aaron's younger pictures? Some I would, again, but that's just back when we weren't using it as a marketing tool. It was just friends. And even still, I would often find myself taking pictures of him from behind or his his head was down. And it was just a more, you know, I don't want to say like I'm this big photographic artist, but in a more artistic way where you couldn't see his face. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even necessarily tell him if I took the picture or I showed it. And, and at one point I realized when he was really young, because that's the time that some of the kids in his class were getting phones and I took a picture and he's like, did you put it on Facebook? And I said, ah, oh, yeah, I put that one. And then a short while later, he came back to me and he said, how many likes did we get? And I went, oh, this is not good. Mm -hmm. So, and I just said, ah, oh, I don't know. I said, it doesn't really matter how many likes you get. So mm -hmm. don't, now kids are everywhere and social media parents taking pictures of their babies. There's some beautiful influencers that have, I see pictures of their children that are, you know, kind of part of their, their business, whether it's like a fashion influencer or something else. And the pictures are beautiful, but you want to make sure that that relationship between the device and what people are saying and how many likes it's getting, that that has nothing to do with your kid, that you don't even tell them about that part of it. They're going to figure out about it. They're going to hear it from kids at school, but you just need to keep reinforcing the message that 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 doesn't matter because that's not quote unquote real life to some extent even though that is their real world so after that comment for a few days you know I we we talked about it and and then after that kind of you know demystified it and and moved on but I think also having that open constant open conversation where you're talking to your kid about it so when they do get old enough that there's an A4 paper challenge that mm -hmm. they can talk about it. Because then now when I see Aaron older, so last year or so, or not year before, because I guess we were still kind of doing COVID stuff. I think it was last year he was talking about, you know, some, a girl that was always sharing stuff on social media and even a guy that was kind of like a sporty guy at school that was taking pictures of his six pack and putting it on. And, and I think because we had talked so much about what's appropriate to put on social media, what's not, um, you know, how do you feel about that? I didn't really like, you know, never like made fun of these kids that were doing it because it's, it's quite sad. And I, and I pointed that out and I, I would, you know, tell him, I would say, that's really sad that, you know, she's putting that out there because for, for whatever reason, she's wanting attention or he's wanting attention that he's not getting somewhere else. You don't need to put pictures of yourself on social media to be popular or be liked. So having those kind of discussions early on help, it's not like a guarantee. But it helps. It, it, in our case, it helped. Um, his former school counselor, when they invited me to the school to give a talk to eighth graders once about like, kind of coaching a group coaching session to kind of think about what they want to start doing in the future as they're entering into high school. And I asked her, I said, well, what, you know, what do kids want to be these days? What are they inspired by? And she told me they all want to be YouTubers. And I went, wow. That is sad. <laughs> it is sad. She said there was a girl that she was aware of because her daughter was the same age that even had a YouTube channel that her parents had no idea she had. Mm -hmm she was like, you know, whatever she was YouTubing about, but the, the communication is so important and getting them interested in finding their talents, right? The art, whether it's art, music, whatever it is, all of these children, when they're very young, I strongly believe they show, they show us what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Aaron loved to draw his doodles were crazy and I, I you know he just once he could hold a pencil and he started to draw things and then I realized this so that or he liked music whatever it is whenever you see your child drawn to something it's not mm -hmm. a telephone then foster that in some of my research I also noticed something um, that young girls when they were still child uh, children sorry the ones that were exposed by their parents to a kind of 
concept about health, an introduction of what it means to be healthy from the basics, like why you should go for a walk because it's going to make your heart stronger or drink water because it's going to do this to your brain cells. These kind of talks from a young age allowed some of these girls to care about their health. And even if they start developing some insecurities or pressures about body image from social media, they still had the ability to question if I do this, if I try to get so thin that there is a huge gap between my thighs, if I do it this way, could that harm my heart? Could that be bad for my long-term health? So I think also an early on introduction to caring about being healthy will allow some of the girls when they reach this age and meet these pressures to at least consider what would it do to my health to follow these trends, as opposed to other girls who reported the opposite. These were the most prone to very harsh eating disorders and consequences at that age, because it was very easy for them to believe that looking like that means that I win at life and mm -hmm. I'm healthy and everything is great, which is not. So I think that could be a factor as well. Just sometimes in some regions, especially parents forget to explain to their, their children why they should be healthy or how. And I think that plays a part as well. I never thought of that actually in, in a diabetes context. And probably, you know, people often ask, like Mohammed al Bahar asked the question this weekend, um, what was the good thing about a, you know, your your child having diabetes and anything positive come from it? And I said, Yeah, of course, all the people we met. But perhaps another thing that I never thought of was that you're always talking about health. And not in the context of like good blood sugar, bad blood sugar. I made sure it was always about what's healthy, what's eating healthy activity. And perhaps this could have offset a lot of challenges. I don't know. I, I'd be curious to know what moms of young girls with diabetes experience in this context. Likely because that would be such a fascinating study, Toko. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I mean, it sounds likely because we always say that even for adults, diabetes encourages you to live the way that all people should live. Everyone should live like they have diabetes. But I think that's a very good point because it could be true that many mothers don't talk to their children about their health as much simply because they don't realize that they have to. But having a chronic condition makes you realize that very early on. So, of mm. course, we can't wish, like we say, diabetes on anyone, but that is interesting that it could be a positive side of that. That could, yeah. that could be a really, that's very interesting. Now, there is, I mean, of course, also a lot of people listening will be very familiar. There is diabulimia, mm -hmm. and um, we had an episode about that. I think it was last season or maybe the first season. At times moving so quickly. I don't remember when we had Nor on the show, but that is a thing. And there's a lot of studies around that. It's being talked about more often. So if you do have a child with diabetes, particularly a girl, but it can affect boys too, you do need to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. But just anybody listening, yeah, talking to kids and teens and everyone about health in general, it's so important. And to start talking from an early age. Mm -hmm. And I was so surprised that my son went on a camping trip last week. Um, it was exhausting for me because all the prep and getting everything and doing it all. And he went, you know, for the most part, took care of himself. And they'd send me a picture of the CGM graph at the end of the day and the blood sugars were all over the place. And I thought that could be maybe he wasn't doing a great job managing because they were active. But then someone told me about the food that they were eating and Aaron came home and he said, mom, the food, <laughs> the first thing he said to me, he's like, mom, the food was horrible. <laughs> and in his words, he said, the, the healthiest thing were the protein bars that you sent with me. And I was like, come on, it can't be that bad. And I did see there were some fruits and salad and stuff there, but maybe that was more for the chaperones. But he's like, mom, all they served, it was like hot dogs and bad ones and chicken nuggets. And, and I get it. It's hard for kids to, you know, it's hard to feed a bunch of kids and make sure they're well-fed. 
and have enough calories for the next day when you're doing like a camping trip and all these activities. But somewhere along the way, kids grew up thinking that, or people and parents grew up thinking that hot dogs and burgers are kid food. Mm -hmm. And actually on the contrary, that's the last thing they need. They need to eat healthy. So we're everything in moderation for sure. My son loves like a good burger. If, if he had access to like his favorite burger place, he would go there every day. Mm -hmm. But, um, but we don't, you know, that's, that's not, not healthy for him to come home and say the food wasn't good. That's and something. then the, that's something. And this made me think about why his blood sugar was then the way it was. And we know like with burgers and fries, there's insulin resistance or whatever, but it's something for him to come home and say the food wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. So I would be proud. That's a really good thing. And it's yeah, very yeah. Funny. Well, it depends too. I mean, they were, they were camping on a beach, but near a hotel. So when kids see hotels, sometimes, you know, what was he expecting sushi? I don't know. So it, <laughs> again, I didn't dig deeper into this expectation, but he knew it wasn't healthy. And... He, he knew, he knew actually that's true. That's true. But I was trying to get him out of like, he, you know, came home and he dropped all the things that he didn't like about the trip. I said, what was the best thing about the trip? <laughs> and it was that his, his uh, group chaperone, who was his band um, teacher, plays really good ultimate frisbee <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know which was not not the intent of the trip but he had a good time okay. so yeah it's really weird like when it comes to that kind of like when do you start talking about food and what's healthy food and you know if you go to a restaurant and you go to a kid's uh you know you get a kid's menu every kid's menu is the same it's junk food mm -hmm. um actually the owner of sprout uh, Oz, she was on the show sprout. They make healthy food for kids. We talk about this all the time, mm -hmm. like start early. Your child doesn't always have to order from the kid's meal. Mm -hmm. We didn't even show Aaron a kid's meal until once we were out with friends and they asked for a kid's meal. And he looked at me, he was maybe four or five. And he was like, what? There's like a special kid's <laughs> menu for me. And I was <laughs> like, no. because we were feeding him like you know, fish and all the other stuff and then enter the kids menu and it's all over. So yeah, that's, I, I don't know, but I think, do you need to do any more studies? Oh, I, think I still have to do studies. I'm continuing till June. So I'll be looking into this. This is all inspiration for me, but yeah, I think the most thing I saw was that talking to your kids from a young age, that how do you feel? Do you feel healthy, whether phys physically or mentally, to ask them this and have them ask themselves this question at a young age is very empowering. And it helps fight these things, even if it doesn't completely stop them, because at least when they see crazy trends, even if they fall for them, even if they fall for the idea that being super thin is the ultimate goal and they try to follow that, at some point they are more likely to re realize I don't feel good doing this, neither physically nor mentally, and I'm going to stop. But kids who were never introduced to this, or even unfortunately, they were only commented to about their food when they gained some weight, mm. they are much more likely to fall into this trap. So it's also really a concept of communicating with your child, like you said, about many things, just having conversations with them. Yeah, but all of those things. Yeah. Is there an age where, I mean, of course you want to communicate and start talking as soon as possible, but did you see certain things happen at certain ages in your, your study? For girls, things go south from 11, 12. Mm. So the early teen years, that's when suddenly I'm, I keep talking about girls because I did more research there, but that's when suddenly already young girls are more prone to be obsessive about how they look and equate that to their happiness or their worth or whatever. And that's already a challenge for parents 10 or 20 years ago. It didn't just start, but now with everything happening on social media, it's much more difficult to the point that many psychiatrists are specializing in how to create courses for parents to prepare them for this, especially if you have young girls. I mean, of course there are also issues with guys and I've seen that, but because of my research, I've seen that it's more on the woman and that just that's just the same as many other things in the world, like 
how a woman looks is held against mm -hmm. her in very unfortunate ways. Yeah, they're one of my, I mean, and it's not just how a woman looks, it's everything, right? There's a few, I mean, it's satire. I follow it. Um, I think it's an Instagram, the woman who, the man who has it all. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not about body image, but it's, it's, I don't know who's behind this account. It's brilliant. Things that they see in the media, whether it's headlines or things that are said to famous women, athletes or actresses oh, yeah. or whatever, <laughs> she flips it and she does it like a man, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and like at a tennis tournament, like yes. does anyone ever ask a man like, oh, who are you wearing or on yes. the red carpet? Nobody the the stuff and the standard for women that is it usually goes always beyond social media and it, goes it, beyond the teenage years it just continues in many fields and in many ways it does I think we become numb to it after a certain period as we get into adulthood and we forget but once I started reading those things in a very kind of satire way flipped and the only word she replaced was woman and man mm -hmm. It, it blew my mind. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is really like worse than I remembered. But yeah, girls and, and social media and body image, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And this is another reason also, I think parents can intervene early and, and they do this in school as well. Usually the, the schools that the bigger schools, you know, that have the resources to do so they mm -hmm. teach what about like internet safety, social media, different things like that. Some of the basics but mm -hmm. as parents, I think you can probably take it to the next level and go a little bit further mm -hmm. um, and hold off on the devices. I mean, we were, Aaron was young about the time that iPads were really becoming a big deal and kids were playing plants versus zombies and stuff like that. So by the time he got to school, he mm -hmm. was actually the outcast because he didn't have his own iPad and he didn't know what plants versus zombies was. Mm -hmm. So that's when we said, okay. In moderation, yes, you can start a bit because then he could talk to the other kids about whatever game they were playing. So it's not like just saying, oh, you have to be a social outcast and don't have a phone or don't, you know, do any of it. But when they're really young, you have to set boundaries and you have to stick to it. Yes. They're going to nag you. They're going to be upset. They're not going to like it because there's always going to be someone out there with you know, the better phone, the access to everything and endless things like that. And I still hear it at this age, but I'm like, sorry, not sorry. You know, nobody, you know, <laughs> needs X, Y, Z. So you just have to really stick to your boundaries and know that that will serve them, hopefully serve them better. Yes, I agree. So I have one last question for you. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most frustrating and the funniest pieces of misinformation you've seen on social media outside of me giving my dog vinegar yes <laughs> which by the way I didn't continue the funniest <laughs> I know I know well that was the funniest situation that resulted <laughs> and thank goodness nobody was harmed but you know and and this is the thing about the social media advice like if I know that it's not it didn't kill my dog and I knew that giving him a little bit of vinegar was not going to physically harm him medically I said, I'll try it, right? If if there's someone out there promoting more ways to get vitamin D, mm -hmm. you know, with the exception of like taking, you know, some extreme massive amounts of, of a pill or a vitamin or something, we all need it. You should still ask your doctor about vitamins and stuff like that. But I, I want to say these common sense things, but it's hard for me to say that because I work in healthcare, right? So I, I see kind of, I know like how much is okay to take or not take and that kind of stuff. But if I know that, you know, it's not going to be a major drastic effect, then, you know, I won't try it. But there's a lot of, a lot of misconceptions, and I'm sure that I see them all the time. One of the saddest ones that made me really angry was there was a woman, I don't even know, I, I'm sure I unfollowed her. She was quite a leading voice in certain yoga uh, communities and circles. And she shared on her social media that, you know, she could cure type one with like just plant-based or vegan diet, which was just misinformation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it was her ignorance that she thought like type two and type one were related that a lot of people think type one, type two becomes type one when it gets worse. 
And mm. that's not the case. There's a lot of people out there that ask me that question sometimes like, so was he type two first? No, they're, they're very different conditions, um, but involve the pancreas and insulin secretion and things like that. So that's why they're called both called diabetes. Mm -hmm. Um, but she, you know, very ignorantly said this, and there were a few people with type one or parents of type one that jumped on it. And then she removed the post. Another one, um, there's a amazing podcast I've mentioned to you before called the proof run by Simon Hill, who I think is a PhD in nutrition. Yeah. He's Australian mm -hmm. and he talks a lot. The podcasts are so deep. Like I'm listening in the car. I need to pull over and take notes kind of deep. It's like a course because mm -hmm. he interviews a lot of experts. And even still, even if they're all PhDs and doctors and MDs and qualified, if you were to listen to that podcast and you heard something that might change your healthcare or medication or something drastically, you need to still ask your doctor about it. But I trust that this guy is qualified. And he has from time to time a... Um, a guy who is an exercise physiologist that they know each other. They live in Australia. I think his account is called Drew's Daily Dose. His first name is Drew. I forget his last name. So they will talk about these fallacies, these false accounts or false claims. And they'll, they'll tear it apart in a very scientific way. And what they say, they read it, they, they don't like name and shame necessarily. They do invite them sometimes to come on the show and then they have a debate about it, like an open, friendly debate, especially if it's someone that says they're an MD, why they think that. But there was one that uh, they highlighted recently that comes to mind where uh, indigenous tribe somewhere in Africa mm -hmm. um, this doctor was very pro like meat, like meat a diet high in animal protein is a way to go. Everyone needs to eat this way. And he said, and these people in this tribe, this is what they eat and look how thin they are and look how healthy they are and, and all the things. So they approach this from a scientific perspective and they, they take a deep dive. And in addition to the part I'm about to tell you, but because they have the background and the PhD and know all the statistics and figures and, and the numbers around it. So first of all, they'll look at it from that perspective, you know, mm -hmm. how many grams of protein do you need? What about, you know, cholesterol, this, that, what offsets it all, all these things mm -hmm. that, you know, to the point of exhaustion, but they took a deeper dive into that tribe to look at what they really ate because they don't always have access to meat. It would depend on migration patterns and different things. Mm -hmm. And they, I believe it was, it was meat that was the claim, but what they found also was that this tribe, they ate a lot of honey yeah. because they have access to bees. We mm -hmm. know honey is high in sugar. They also mm -hmm. ate a lot of berries depending on the season. Mm -hmm. So those kind of generic general claims where someone's saying, oh, this group of people have the best diet on the planet. Generalizing. Yeah. Yeah. Generalizing and without really researching it, um, without studying them, you know, did the, that doctor really go down and do a blood draw and on this whole tribe and look mm -hmm. at what, you know, who knows, there's a lot of things that can be happening genetically. Mm -hmm. If they're indigenous, they're not sitting in front of a computer all day. They're probably yeah. moving around. Uh, I mean, there, there's so many different things. If I open my internet right now, I'm sure I could find it, it's almost daily. I see at least one, First, at, at least false one thing. false thing. And sometimes I start to comment, comment on it. And like I said, sometimes I stop because I think, do I need to be a part of that conversation? Because then what's going to happen? You're going to go back and forth and get, you know, all this extra discussion mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, I'm not going to change this person's mind. They're not going to change my mind. So let me go put all of that energy into really supporting people that need it instead of just some, you know, random person that's written yes. something very false. Mm -hmm. But that, that one I can think of, um, gosh, I'm sure there's so many after we're done talking and I get in my car to go to like my next meeting or wherever, I'll probably start remembering all of them. 
and yeah. I don't write a list. <laughs> or uh, on yeah, <laughs> or type one moms, especially in the US, they're really good at sharing like, hey, I just saw this account. They made this false claim about type one diabetes. And then all the moms will run and they'll comment under it to dismiss the claim, you know, when it's really false. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, it's, it's super, super tricky. Or like when people say an unhealthy diet led to type one diabetes, uh, I can very quickly point out that my son was 20 months old and he wasn't eating by unhealthy. They usually say fast food and stuff like that. At 20 months old, he was not on a fast food diet. <laughs> And we were making his, his food and it was all fruits and vegetables as much as possible and organic and very healthy. Um, and he still got type one diabetes. So it does happen, but the, the claims are endless. What's the most bizarre thing that you've ever heard? Oh, the most bizarre thing that I've ever heard. I can't think of anything after we discuss the A4 paper and the thigh gaps. That's all I can think of right now. That's the most bizarre yeah. thing that I've heard in a while. I didn't know about that one. That one just breaks my heart all over. But honestly, there are crazy things I see. Like, for example, I saw on this group, someone recommend to people that if they stop eating sugar, if they cut sugar completely from their diet, and they this is a group of people who have cancer diagnosis, that their tumors will stop growing and they could be healed. And that's just, I, I have no words because you're giving a cure for cancer on social media very casually. And you're just saying quit sugar. I mean, of course, eating sugar in an unhealthy way and eating anything in an unhealthy way could develop risk factors to develop cancers. But once you have cancer, God forbid, there is no cure. And if you're going to suggest a cure, at least try to make it medical. Don't tell people to just change their diet and they won't have cancer anymore. So I think that was the funniest and most frustrating two in one for me that I yeah, saw. Yeah, I see the, the sugar cancer relationship a lot. Yeah. And I haven't read enough about that, that research to say that avoiding sugar, you won't get cancer. There's other reasons people get cancer, I'm sure, outside of sugar. Um, or if sugar is even the cause and we're and not oncologists. So it's, yeah, though that one does drive me a little crazy because I think of all the different types of cancers that people get. Um, mm -hmm. and like my father's had two friends that actually close friends that he's lost to cancer. One was prostate cancer. Another had pancreatic cancer and they weren't people that were like drinking sugar, you know, all the time, especially the guy that had prostate cancer was like a bodybuilder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's super healthy lifestyle. So and it it's yeah. chronic conditions can be very random and there's still a lot we don't know. So for people to just throw these statements out there, it's really frustrating. And at the end, prevention is a totally different conversation than cure. Once I see the word cure next to the word cancer, I'm just frustrated because if there was a cure for cancer, I'm pretty sure doctors would prescribe it. We yeah. wouldn't get it from social media. So yeah, yeah, cancer, yeah. same for diabetes. People use that a lot, the cure. And I, I always delete them, but I don't know if they're bots or what, but under the dia point posts, I know you see yeah, it, you get a lot of like, I've cured this, I've cured that. And I'm like, I guess we've made it, we're making an impact if we're getting the like cure, you know, herpes or or whatever it is that the bots that keep coming underneath that we have to keep removing it on some of the posts because it's false information and it could be a virus or whatever it is. So if you ever see those kind of comments under any of our posts, don't click on it. We will probably delete it within the hour because either Toka or I are like watching it carefully. Yeah. So that's it from my side. I think one last thing I want to say, and it's not a question, is that, like you said, we can't, as Dia Point, go out there and correct every piece of mis misinformation we see. But we do work hard to advocate besides our products and services and coaching and training and all these things. We work to advocate and we also work to provide as much free educational resources as possible. And now we're focusing even more on doing that in Arabic because we are aware that in the Arab region, there are many people struggling with access to just healthcare information. 
And Diabetes Hour is one of the most important initiatives we're running for this, especially that we're collaborating with the great doctors and physicians in ASPED, and that the sessions will include open question and answers um, time. So everyone who joins can ask these doctors whatever they want, and that's important. And I think the next important thing for us, for all our audience that's listening, is that if they think that there is something else we can do, more information we can provide, if there is a need that we still don't see in terms of educating, then please reach out to us and we will try to make that happen. Definitely. Well said. And in these ASPED sessions, I encourage you, if you've seen anything on social media, bring it to the session. Yes, we'll have the really, it, it, it's one, it, the doctor can explain it to you, but two, you're doing a service to other people also as well. So that if people are seeing something that's really incredibly false out there, then mm -hmm. a qualified doctor can tell you, or they can tell you, depending on what country you're in, they might know a qualified doctor that you could go see. Exactly. And other than the products and services on our store, we also have many free articles and free resources. And again, you can send us an email if you'd like us to write about something specific that you're wondering about anytime. That's true. And we'll be launching more of those in Arabic soon. Yes, we will. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. And thank you, Toka, for all thank your you. thoughtful <laughs> questions and your research as well. Thank you. I we want to, well, well, we want to talk about this again, because I think there's more to learn from your research oh, when you finish it. Work, the more I'll have to share. So anytime, <laughs> really. All right. We look forward to it. Thank Thanks you. So Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.